really glad you're here. In 1995, not long after getting married, I got a phone call at, uh, at my job. I had just was wrapping up a, uh, a third shift, an overnight shift, I worked, I worked third shift, and I was just getting ready to head home about 8 o'clock in the morning. I got a call. So I answered the call, and it was one of my wife's co-workers. One of the, she was a nurse, and, and uh, she worked in an office adjacent to the hospital. And they told me that Stacy had uh, experienced a great deal of pain in, the, in their stomach in the morning, and it was just doubled over in pain, and, and they, they got a wheelchair and rushed her over to the hospital just next door. And that was all they knew at the time. So I was, I was I'd been up all night, I'd been slamming coffee, hadn't eaten anything, and so I made a beeline over to the hospital. Made it into the ER where they had her back in one of the triage rooms. And they were trying to start an IV. And I, you know, I didn't, I, mean, I was 23 years old. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. I was kind of stressed out. And uh, this is her absolute favorite story. Look at her. She's beaming over there. She loves this. is her favorite story of all time. The nurse jabbed her. I don't know three or four times in one arm, three or four times in another arm, and they just couldn't get an IV started. So she's, I don't know what's going on. She's doubled over in pain on this on this, this, this makeshift bed. And the nurse is trying to, is, you know, stabbing my wife repeatedly trying to start an IV. And in the midst of all this, well, actually, when the, when the nurse finally did get the IV started, and I had, you know, there was sort of an element of control, I chose that moment to pass out. Yeah bounced off the wall and I wake up on the floor and I see Stacy with an IV you know, catheter still sticking in her arm leaning over the side of the, of the bed staring down at me and the nurse is staring like, you know, what's happened? Now I've got two patients and my explanation for that, my defense, uh, such as I can muster, was what bothered me was just seeing her in such a, a, a painful and, and uh, condition. Didn't know what was going on. She was hurting, and I just said, you know, that it did. I guess it upset me and gave me kind of a sensory overload to see my wife in in, in that kind of a state. When we love people, it hurts to see them hurt. And God is exactly the same way. There's so many there's so many ways that we could talk about us being that we are made in God's image. So many of the traits that we have, the good ones, not the bad ones, but the good ones, are traced directly back to God. Sometimes we feel these things because He feels these things. When we hurt, God hurts with us. The God of Christianity is different in His relation to us than any other religious figure of any other type of faith system. He's very personal to us. Jesus Christ was God made flesh. He was fully human and He was fully God. We have to talk another time about what that means. But the truth of it is undeniable. And the reason why Jesus had a physical body, one of the reasons was not just so he could feel empathy, but so that he could feel sympathy for us. Empathy is when you just feel bad for somebody. Sympathy is when you can say, I know what you're going through because I've been through it. It's a deeper level of connection. Jesus was able to do that. We need to remember that he was human. And that he was tempted in all points like as we are with regard to sin. But he did not sin, according to what the Hebrew writer says. He was tempted in all points like we are. That means that he had physical needs. He needed food. He needed clothing. He needed rest. All those things that we need, he needed as well. When he had a physical body, he had physical needs, but he also had emotional needs. He needed friendship. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And the example of Jesus he gave us is such a great example in so many things. So many areas. But one thing they did was he showed us what a real friend is and what a real friend does. Jesus was a good friend to his disciples. And he's a good friend to us. And his example will show us how we can be a good friend to him, as we discussed this this morning. And I'm going to be avoiding some of the, the bigger, grander aspects of, of Jesus 
as our Savior, as our Lord, as our Redeemer. I just want to focus on the little things that Jesus did that we can do also. So we'll sort of narrow our focus here this morning on, on just that. But first we'll, we'll address this idea that Jesus was a good friend to his disciples. How was Jesus a good friend to his disciples? Well, one way was that he desired their company. He wanted to be around them. He wanted to be with them. In John chapter 15, as we're gathered in the upper room for what we know would be the Last Supper, as we call it, before he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane and be arrested and crucified the next day. John chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. He's looking ahead a little bit at the ministry and the work that they would do in evangelizing the world with the gospel. But he says, I called you my friends, not my servants, not my disciples, my friends. And he says, I chose you. He chose to be with them. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, in Luke's account of this uh, time, it is, as they're eating what then would be the Passover meal, Jesus had said that he had greatly desired to share this Last Supper with them. Jesus knew the timetable of everything that was going to be happening. He knew the schedule, and he knew that this was going to be the last time that they would, he would be gathered together with his disciples before his crucifixion. And he said, I have really been looking forward to this. The night before his death was spent with his friend. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't you want to do the same? Knowing the, the, the tremendous trial that was to come upon him on the cross, taking on the sins of the world, he said, I need this last bit of time with my friends to encourage me and just to spend time with them. You see a great glimpse into the humanity of Jesus there. And he wasn't teaching a lot during this time. There wasn't a lot of real deep uh, theological doctrine talked about in that meal, but it was just time for them to be together. He was showing them his love for them. Certainly these memories would be there to comfort them after he was gone. And he had said in John 14 and verse 3, he said, I'm, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I will come and take you and bring you to where I am, that we may be together. He wants to bring them where he is. Why? Because he desires their company. He wants to have them with him. Something else to show Jesus to be a good friend to his disciples was he stuck up for his friends. Good friends stick up for each other. Many times uh, the Pharisees and the enemies of Jesus would try to attack him through his, through his, his sheep, through his disciples. They would say, well, what are your disciples? They don't wash their hands properly. They're not following the law of Moses. Well, look, they're gathering grain on the Sabbath. They're breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus would turn the critics of his disciples against them and do it to their shame. He would say, leave them alone. They're not breaking any laws. And he stuck up for them. They're not doing any such thing. Zacchaeus was a man who was despised. He was a tax collector. Everyone turned their nose up at him, and yet Jesus said, I'm going to go to your house for lunch today, Zacchaeus. And at his house, again, as there are those who are sneering that Jesus would be uh, in the midst of tax collectors and sinners and all of these uh, fringe of society, the, the dregs here. And Jesus says that, he looks at Zacchaeus and he says, I've come for such as them. The kingdom of God is not for the Pharisees and for the rich and the rulers. He said the kingdom of God is for the poor and the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes. The kingdom of God is for such as them, like Zacchaeus, right here. And he refers to them, he refers to Zacchaeus in their presence, equally as a son of Abraham, just as much as they are. He stuck up for Zacchaeus, what that must have meant to him, how that must have filled his heart to see Jesus standing up for him. Jesus knew that his disciples were going to suffer. He knew they were going to suffer in their service to him, especially after he was gone. But he said, for now, just leave them be. Leave them alone. Jesus was a good friend because he stuck up for his friends. He also helped his friends. 
In Mark's Gospel, we see not once but twice in chapter 4 and chapter 6, there were two, two events where they were out on the Sea of Galilee and the ship and, and the boat they were on, there was a storm and the waves were coming over and the disciples all thought they were going to die. And Jesus calmed the storm to protect them. There was a, a lesson to be found in that teaching, but don't, don't overlook just the simple, the simple act of helping his friends when they were in distress. In John chapter 14, in verse 18, when Jesus is telling them that there will be a time that he needs to depart, he will be leaving, but he said, I will not leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you all alone. He said, I will send the Holy Spirit. And he refers to the Holy Spirit as a helper. He said, he's going to help you. There will be great difficulties ahead for them. He knew this. And the Holy Spirit was going to guide them and encourage them in this. Jesus was a good friend because he helped his friends when they had need. He also cared about his friends. He cared about them. They weren't just there to serve him. He genuinely loved them. In John chapter 11, we read about how Lazarus, uh, that friend of Jesus, has died. And he goes to Bethany to mourn with the friends and family of Lazarus. Now, don't let our knowledge of what happens later. We know he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but don't let that color or diminish the simple action of Jesus going to help people grieve. Jesus himself was understandably sad because his friends had died. And a family that he loved was sad, and he wanted to go and be with them and comfort them. And when they come and approach him, when the sisters of Lazarus ask him that bitter question, why didn't you come sooner? If only you'd been here, my brother would not have died. How that must have stung and pierced the heart of Jesus. And even though he knew the outcome, even though he knew Lazarus was going to walk out of that tomb, he did not minimize their sorrow because... That would have been cruel and uncaring. Jesus didn't say to Mary and to Martha, Look, it's no big deal. Relax. Stop your crying. Get over it. He didn't minimize their pain. He didn't offer any advice. He didn't try to fix it in that moment. He simply offered them a shoulder to cry on. He absorbed their grief. And he even cried with them. He was being a good friend. Friends hurt when you hurt. Jesus cared about his friends and he also prayed about his friends. The entire 17th chapter of John is called the High Priestly Prayer. It's a prayer of Jesus and it's his prayer for his disciples. He's praying that God will strengthen them and give them boldness and protection for the work that they're about to engage in. He asks the Heavenly Father to watch over them and to guide them after He ascends back into the heavens. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 32, we see there that Jesus prays specifically for Peter's strength. He said, Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you like me, but I have prayed to the Father that when you return to me, that you will be emboldened, that you will be a leader and a guide to the rest of the apostles. He specifically prayed for Peter for his restoration, for his courage. A good friend prays for his friends. Jesus was also a good friend because he forgave his friends. When Jesus had said, when you return to me, where was Peter going to return from? Well, he was going to betray him. Peter denies Jesus. He abandons Jesus three times. Denies that he even knows him in fear. Now, this was not... A mere disagreement. This was not merely a, a, a doctrinal disagreement. This was a bitter divide. And yet, in John chapter 21, verse 15, that threefold denial of Peter becomes a threefold declaration of love. And Jesus orchestrated all of this. The apostles are gathered there and he asks Peter, Do you love me? And he asks him three times. Seemingly, one declaration of love for each of Peter's betrayal, uh, each of his denials. And Peter is in a sense restored in front of the other apostles. If there were any lingering doubts with Peter, well, now he's, he denied Jesus. Can we trust him? Is he going to be on board here with, you know, with this preaching of the gospel? Jesus is showing them in a very real and a very tender and loving way, I've forgiven Peter. I trust Peter. And you can trust him too. 
Everything was fine. He was a good friend because he forgave his friend. Jesus, Peter was a, you know, Jesus was a good friend even to his enemies. Even to his enemies. Now he preached that we ought to forgive our enemies, but he didn't just preach it, he practiced it. You see that when they come to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter swings a sword and cuts an ear off of the high priest's servant. Jesus doesn't say, that'll teach you. That'll show you to come after the Son of God. Jesus picks up that piece of flesh and reattaches it to his head. He heals that man's ear. This is a man who is going to take him to his death. But he showed kindness and healed him. Giving us a great example. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, what I feel are some of the most touching words of Jesus in all the Scripture. As they are nailing him to the cross, as the hammer is being swung, as the nails are being driven into his flesh, Jesus prays for his murderers. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was a good friend even to his enemies. He was a good friend to everyone. And that certainly extends to us today. So let's look at ways now that Jesus is a good friend to us. He was a good friend to the disciples. He's a good friend to us today. How? How has he shown himself to be a good friend to us? Well, in exactly the same points that we looked at before. Jesus desires our company just as much as he did the, the apostles and his disciples. He wants to be with us. John chapter 14 and verse 3, that, that home that is being prepared for us is heaven. He wanted the apostles to be with him, and he also wants us to be there with him too. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Jesus isn't just calling us up to be with him. He's coming back down to get us. He wants us to be gathered with him at his second coming, because he wants to be with us. The Gospel of Matthew ends with the words, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He wants to be with us. Jesus was a good friend to the disciples, sticking up for them. He also sticks up for us. Satan has no accusation to make it. That's the name Satan means adversary, opponent, accuser. He is referred to as the accuser. He is the one who stands before the throne of God and says, these people have violated your laws. They don't deserve to be in heaven. You can't forgive them. Jesus stands up for us as our defense attorney. He stood up for us in the most powerful way on the cross, denying the power of death, denying the power of Satan, and the power of sin. He was a good friend to us then. A good friend helps us. Jesus helps us. He bears our burdens. Not just the burden of sin. Certainly that, but not just that, even our everyday worries. Big, little, and everywhere in between. Have you ever had like a big, heavy couch, like a sleeper couch or something, or a refrigerator, and you've got to move that thing, and you're dreading it, and you, you're calling, hey, I need some help. i got to move this couch on Saturday. Can you come over? And a friend would say, yeah, I'll come over and give you a hand. No problem. I'll be right there. I need to move this refrigerator, and I can't do it by myself. No problem. I'll, I'll, I'll come on over and help you. That's a friend indeed. Helping each other bear our burdens. Not just physical burden like that, but spiritual burden as well. I think that's all involved in what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. He says there, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens and in doing so you will fulfill the law of Christ. Why is it called the law of Christ? Well, it's his law. But he did it first. Bearing one another's burdens. Jesus lived by that. He did it first. He showed us how. We have to do that. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He said those great words of hope to all those who labor and are heavy laden. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. He wants to help us with our burdens. Like a good friend does. Jesus is a good friend to us also because he prayed for us. You look back in John chapter 17 and you think, Jesus is praying there for his disciples, but he's also praying for you. Maybe you never noticed that before. Jesus said a prayer specifically for you, sitting right here today. 
John chapter 17, and verse 20. Jesus says in his prayer, he's speaking to the Father, and he says, I do not pray for these alone, that is, these 12, 11 by that time, after Judas had left, not just for these apostles gathered here with me in this room, but he says, also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus prayed for you, that we would all be together in one body, connected with him. Jesus was a good friend in praying for us. Also, he was a good friend in that he forgave us. John chapter 15 and verse 13 says, There is no greater love than to give one's life for his friends. Jesus didn't die on the cross for his worshipers. He didn't die on the cross for his students and disciples and followers and servants. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life for his friends. You know, I can't get through a sermon without mentioning Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 where the, God, the love of God is demonstrated in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. If Jesus is a good friend to us by forgiving us, he showed us a good example there. The situation described in Romans chapter 5 is not of us begging forgiveness from Jesus. Recognizing that we are in the wrong. We are the ones that owe a debt. And we are asking Jesus. We're asking God for forgiveness. That's not the situation there. It's almost reversed. We are outside of Christ. Enemies of God. Weak. Without strength. Rebels against God's laws and His commands. We are the, the offended party as we see ourselves almost standing there pouting. And we are the ones demanding an apology. Jesus, who had done no wrong, owed no debt, he is the one who reached forward and forgave us. Wonderful example for us. He set a very high standard. So Jesus has been a great friend to us. How can we be his friend? Let's close this morning by looking at how we can be a good friend to Jesus. And it's the very same points we've been talking about all morning. We can be a good friend to Jesus by desiring His company, by abiding in Him, abiding in His Word, and in His church, His body, being connected to it, having fellowship with Him weekly. That's what we do when we observe the Lord's Supper, as we'll do here in just a few minutes. We are remembering His sacrifice. We are having communion, uniting ourselves with Him and with that sacrifice. And we do it on a weekly basis so that we don't forget, so it gets driven deeper and deeper into our hearts every week. And be a good friend to Jesus by desiring His company. That means that we, can, we need to live our lives in a way so that we can be where He is. Where is He? He is in heaven. We can't get there on our own. We have been given commands, we've been given instructions, we've been given warnings, and we can live our lives according to all of those things so that we can be where He is. That would be showing ourselves to be a good friend to Jesus. He stuck up for us. We can be a good friend to Jesus by sticking up for Him. 1 Peter 3.15 says that we need to be ready to give a defense, to give a reason for the hope and the faith which lies within us. That means we need to, to be studying the Word. We need to know how to make those defenses. It means we shouldn't be ashamed of Christ ever, at any point, for any reason. We should never desert Him like the disciples did when He was arrested. We can stick up for Him by defending His name. When we hear His name slandered, when He is insulted, when He is mocked, when His, word, his, his name is used as curse word, stand up and defend him. A good friend helps his friends. We can't help Jesus. Jesus doesn't need our help for anything. But if we're going to be a good friend to him, we can let him help us. He asked for our burdens. 
We can show ourselves to be a good friend to Jesus by giving them to Him. By taking His helping hand that is outstretched to us. By accepting the peace that He wants for us to have. That He worked so hard to provide. Let Him help us. Finally, we can be a good friend to Jesus by loving Him. He tells us how. He tells us how to love Him. How we show that love in John chapter 15, verse 14. He says, if you love me, you will do what I say. You will keep my commandments. Verse 14 of John 15, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, He's not our friends because we obey His commands. Jesus doesn't only love us when we obey it's not a conditional type of love in that regard. It isn't that He doesn't love us until we obey those commands. He loves us always. That's why God sent Him to be our Savior. Because He loves us even when we are standing against Him. Even when we are lost in our sin. He still loves us. But Jesus says, if you love me, if you are my friends, you can show that by obeying my commands. Actions, not words, prove love. Jesus is God. He is our master. He is our savior. He is our creator. He is our king. He is the alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. But he's also our friend. He's the best friend anyone could ever have. He is always with us. He's never too busy. He shares our triumphs and He shares our heartbreaks and disappointments. And He wants to be with us all the time. He cries with us when we are down and He lifts our spirits. And Jesus has done what no other friend could do. He saw us hurting and struggling with sin and He reached down out of heaven to help us. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. And He's promised us eternal life if we'll follow Him. So I urge you, if you have not, be a friend to Jesus today by obeying His commands. Believe His Word, repent of sin, confess Him as Lord and Master and even friend. And be baptized. Be immersed in the water that your sins might be washed away. Maybe you've done those things, but you haven't been a very good friend to Jesus. If that's the case, then make that right today. Repent of that. Recommit yourself to Him. Come back to Him. If we can help you in any of those areas, if we can pray for you and encourage you today, please come. Make that need known to us. Let us be a friend to you as well. Let us help you and show our love and care. Make that need known to us as we stand and sing this song. Please come.